Hey everybody, so good to be with you again. We're continuing our series on why we worship. And as you can see, I'm, I'm set up just a little bit different. I've got my friend with me, here she is. <laughs> And that's not really my friend. My real friend with me today is my beautiful, gorgeous wife, Pam. Welcome. We're going to do this together, right? Yes, we are. I better be first place over you, the guitar. My <laughs> goodness. You totally take first place over this guitar, hands down. You know, wasn't that so good? Part three with Eloy and Stephanie Martinez, our worship leaders, our dear friends. Man, We've got was, so much response from from. That was so anointed. Thank God. It was amazing. It really was. I, I was so blessed just getting to enjoy that with you guys. You're my special guest and, and Eloy and Stephanie. Again. And here we are again. And we, we got our little guitar with us. And so we're going to continue part four. You know, this series could go on and on, but Pam and I are going to try to mow through this as quick as we can because there's some more real precious biblical nuggets that I just feel are necessary for your life that I want you to get. So let's welcome the Holy Spirit because we can't do anything without God's help. Precious Holy Spirit, we just never want to take for granted the access we have to your presence right now. Holy Spirit, we just invite you to breathe upon the word of God that we read and that it would find its mark in our heart, grow up and produce everlasting fruit in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, Pammy, let's do a quick re little review here. We learned that the Hebrew word for worship is shaka. Do you like the way I say it? Does that sound a little bit Hebrew? Shaka. And it means to bow down with outstretched arms, ready to receive and to behold. Remember that letter hey is right in the middle of those three Hebrew letters that make up the word shaka. And it means to behold, to pay attention to what follows. There are rewards in worship. When you practice what Jesus taught, Talked about true worship. There are outcomes, rewards. There's safety because God deals with our enemies. Thank God for that. And when I talk about enemies, I'm talking about disease, poverty, or even that spiritual force of darkness that would try to lure us into temptation. You know, if you're being tempted with something right now, just man, begin to sing a song of worship and you'll be amazed at how the devil can't stand the pressure and the power of true worship. And we saw how God weaponizes our worship and sets ambushments against our enemies. Remember me with my sledgehammer bringing the hammer down on sickness, depression, fear, running from worship. That's right, from the presence of God. There's joy. Pam, I love that song that you wrote. We talked about it in part three. In the presence of the Lord, there is joy. joy. Wow. You know, and, and always in the presence of the Lord, there is his, his DNA, his character, yeah. which is always comfort and security and safety and a, and a really true joy. You know, it would make sense if you have a visitor show up, that they would show up with their character, with who they are. When God shows up on the scene, he shows up. That's why the Bible says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, right? Because man, where God is, there's light. There can be no darkness. There's no darkness in him. And when God shows up, there's light, beautiful light. So Pam, I bet you when you wrote that song that you never thought you'd see the enemy defeated like we have in our personal life of these last three years, just breaking through the walls of sadness and sorrow. You know, like when you say goodbye to a loved one and they go to heaven, but you're able to sing in the presence of the Lord, there is joy. Man, we've seen the, the miracle of God's joy showing up, right? You know, you have to declare what is true, not what you see. You have to declare is true. God is a good God. He's, so, his presence is good. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's so good. It's so good. So we're talking about the reward of worship. Maybe I should always like kick off like a, a heading with, you know, like a little bit of how about. Something like that. The reward of worship. 
the outcome. Hopefully, as we've been going through these previous parts of this series, it's become a biblical revelation to you that there are great rewards for true worship. On the other side of worship, we read in 2 Chronicles 20 about King Jehoshaphat and his people. They practiced true worship, their enemies were destroyed, and they were three days picking up the spoil. Does that sound good to you? Sounds good to me. <laughs> Abraham worshiped God with his son Isaac, and guess how God responded? By giving his own and begotten son as the seed, capital S, of Abraham. And that's how we got Jesus into our whole situation. The woman at the well in John 4, she learns to worship God and guess what happens? She becomes like the modern day Billy Graham, wins her whole city to Jesus. David the psalmist, he was a famous worshiper of God. And I mean, what else is he famous for? Killing Goliath, the giant. And he got all the rewards that went with that. He got the princess and he got to be tax-free and he got all the blessings that went with that. Paul and Silas in Acts 16, they sang to the Lord and it shook the prison bars open. Freedom, a little bit of like that Mel Gibson, ah, freedom, right? And then the woman with her gift of an alabaster box to Jesus, it reversed all her shame and pain. Wow. She poured out all she had as, a, as an act of worship. Beautiful. You know, Pam, talking about worship, there's a story that I think a lot of times people know about, but they may step over when it comes to worship, and that's the story of the 10 lepers. The 10 lepers, they meet Jesus, and they're asking for help and mercy because, you know, leprosy, it's like advanced gangrene in your body and it's just like body parts are falling off they're becoming mangled deformed it's just it's awful and Jesus they call out to Jesus and here's what Jesus says he says to the lepers go show yourself to the priest see that was biblical law when you got cleansed you go show yourself to the priest so they have this action of faith to respond to Jesus. And as they go, it says, they are cured, all 10 of them. That means the decay was stopped. The leprosy completely yeah. went away. That's right. So now if you had a finger that was missing, right? It's like, praise God, the leprosy is gone, but you still got the finger missing. If your nose had fallen off, you know, the decay had stopped, but your nose was still missing, but they were cleansed. That meant they could go back to their families. They could go back to at least a part of their life. And so they all left and were going away happily to the priest to show that they were clean so that they could get back into real life. But here we pick up the story at Luke 17 verses 15. Can you read that for me? Then one of them upon seeing that he was cured turned back recognizing and thanking and praising God with a loud voice. Oh, wow. <laughs> and he fell prostrate at Jesus' feet, thanking him over and over. And he was a Samaritan. And then Jesus asked him, were not all 10 cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was there no one found to return and to recognize and give thanks and praise to God except you? And he said to him, get up and go on your way. Your faith, your trust and confidence that springs forth from your belief in God has restored you to health. Okay, so check this out. The first guys, the, for all 10 got cleansed. That means they all got free from the leprosy. That means the disease stopped devouring their body. So they could kind of go back to life. But one guy, you got to catch this, one guy decided to come back. One unreligious guy decided to come back to Jesus and give God praise and worship. And when he did, Pam, like think of it, worship is when you bow to the ground. You can imagine he's coming back to Jesus and he goes, praise be to God. And he bows down and he gives God thanks, praise and worship. And the word of God says that he was restored. Now, if you had your bicycle stolen and somebody said, we got your bike restored, that means that your bike is back back better than it ever was. Even if the thieves took it and destroyed it, your bike restored means it's fully back in working great condition the way you had it at its best. This man bows to the ground, worships Jesus, and he was probably missing a finger or two, and all of a sudden as he's lifting up his hands, praising God, all of a sudden, guess what? All the fingers are there. And he lifts up his face from the ground. His nose was missing when it went down to the ground. And when he comes back fully restored, his 
His nose is back on his face. The disciples are in awe of what they see happening on the other side of worship. Now, those other nine guys, Pam, I feel sad for them. They went away cleansed because they heard a word from Jesus. And, you know, and here's what I find a lot of Christians do. They get a word from Jesus and they're out the door. But there really isn't that sense of worship and expectation where they're bowing to the ground and getting restored back what the enemy has stolen. The disease stopped for the others. Come on, I gotta just go. It makes me excited, I'm telling you, it's so good. So do you see that? One leper returns to worship God and something happened. And by the way, did you notice, Jesus noticed that the other nine did not worship God. Yeah. He's like, where are the other nine? Let me tell you, God notices who's really worshiping and who's not. He takes stock of it because it matters. God wants everybody to be restored. But you know, you've got to find yourself in that environment of worship. So true worship, Pam, is holy. I want to use that word holy because I think it's important for us to define it right here. It brings heaven to earth. It's kingdom of God matter. It's holiness. And here's something that I, I don't know if you even know this. Did you know that the word holy doesn't just mean pure and clean? That's right. You know, a lot of times when we think holy, we just think completely, we use that word sanctified, holy. We think just sanitized, spiritually sanitized. Like the, you know, Jesus used some kind of spiritual bleach and it's sanitized. It means pure and clean, but it also means full. Imagine this, if you have a kitchen that's sanitary and clean, but not full of good food. Imagine um, Martha Stewart doing one of her shows where she's got this sanitized kitchen but nothing in it. Yeah. Show wouldn't last very long, yeah, right? <laughs> Holy would be pure and clean, but also full and overflowing with goodness and supply. The word holy actually has built into its meaning, not empty. If you say something, boy, that's holy. This is, when God said this is holy ground, he meant it's not empty. The presence of God has filled it with all of his goodness. You could have a marriage where no one is doing anything wrong. The house is clean, so to speak. Everyone's going through the motions. But if the marriage is not filled with joy, life, happiness, holy, affirmation, love, then it's not holy. You see, that's what we talk about when we marry somebody. We use the word holy matrimony. Yeah. It means full. There's a lot of people with a marriage or some kind of relationship and it doesn't have, it's not pure and clean, but filled with the goodness of God. You want what's holy. And in God's presence, there's holiness. There's that fullness. There's a lot of good sounding and good looking worship in this world, but it's empty. That means it's not true worship, as Jesus said, and it's not holy. It's sterile and it's empty. Remember, Hebrews 11, 6, Pam, says this. You've heard me quote this many times. Without faith, it's what? Impossible to please God. So imagine trying to worship God and it not pleasing God. Pleasing. Well, how can you worship God without faith? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is a rewarder. He's that a he rewarder. Is, that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him, yes, right? Yes. Wow. When God rewards, that means he fills, he supplies. Now that is holy, full, full to the overflow. Remember, unholy is when something is empty, lacking, without supply or unclean. That might mean that you need to have a pruning done. You know, singing is God's way of cutting away the unclean stuff. And, you know, we talked, uh, I think it was part two or part three, we talked about the word sing, which means zamir in Hebrew, or it's pronounced zamir or zamar in Hebrew, and it means both to sing and to prune. So you can prune away the bad stuff in God's presence by singing or even letting him sing over you. Did you know that God sings, Pam? Wow, I love that visual. I love that visual. In Zephaniah 317, it says, The Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one, will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. God instructed Moses to teach Israel a song so that when many evils and troubles, it says, have come upon them, this song shall 
confront them as a witness. Think about that. For it will live unforgotten in the mouths of their offspring. That's Deuteronomy 31, verse 21. See, singing can help us remember words. God wants to access the frontal lobe of your long-term and your short-term memory with His promises. That's why I think it's so important when we're singing worship that we sing words that we um, pull out of God's Word, words that we know are eternal and true. That's why Jesus said in John 4, the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. you got to have that truth side of the equation. You know, there's a singing and a guitar playing going on in heaven, Pam. Yes, there is. I mean, God's singing. You just read that from Zephaniah. Sings over us. He sings over us. I mean, he does a little pruning, a little bit of encouraging, a little filling with his singing. But, you know, there's singing that goes on in heaven and there's guitar playing. Um, just maybe a little bit like this. Sweet guitar playing, maybe. Revelation 5, 8 to 10. Can you read that for us, Pam? Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, and each having a harp or a guitar, and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seal, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and every tongue and people of every nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Wow. We did a nice job for that, didn't we? We did. <laughs> Notice what they sing, Pam. Notice what they sing. They sing, you've redeemed us to God by your blood out of, out of what? Out of every tribe, out of every tongue, out of every people, out of every nation. You see, we cannot truly be, fulfill our true identity until we come out of who we were genetically, out of my own blood history. We need to talk about what happened 2,000 years ago at the cross of Calvary when Jesus shed his blood, God's DNA, to earth, brought it to earth in a container of the vessel of his body so that we could all, every one of us, without exception, without, it doesn't matter what creed, what color, what, what background, what nation, what tribe, what language, it doesn't matter if you're English or French, we all need a blood transfer from heaven, from God the Father. You see, the racial divide going on is proof that we're not truly worshiping God because true worship is done by those who are redeemed by the blood of Jesus out of every tribe. Notice that word. I got to keep saying it. Out of every tribe, out of every people. True worship always has a power outcome. No one person in heaven talks, sings about their blood. There's nobody in heaven, Pam, going, oh, I've got the most amazing blood and I've got such serious genetics. Nobody's doing that in heaven. Everybody's singing glory to the blood of the Lamb. That's what they're singing. It's all about the DNA of God the Father. Look, if your DNA was so great, God wouldn't have had to send His only begotten Son to save you from it. It's all about the one blood that has the power to give us true identity. Saints of God, stop. Get a hold of yourself. Get back to the blood of Jesus. Because you see, without faith, it's impossible to please God. God has no delight in religion or worship without an outcome. None. No pleasure at all. So Pam, let's quickly talk about idolatry. False worship. It's unholy. Idolatry is simply worshiping something or someone other than the source of all life. And to think about this, this is such a ridiculous thing we're about to read. The devil wanted Jesus to fall down and worship him, the devil, for a reward. Can you just imagine that? Satan thinking he can get the creator to worship the created. And not just any created, but a lying, stealing, murdering, stinky fraud. Yes. Right? So read for me Matthew 4. Verses 8 through 10, this is Jesus in the wilderness being tempted by the devil. 
Again, the devil took him up on a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And Satan said to him, all these things I'm going to give you if you fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said to him, go away, Satan, for it's written and forever remains written. You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. You see, Satan was trying to create what I call worship feedback by getting the source of life to bow down and worship death. Ooh. He was trying to get life to worship death so he could galvanize his position as some kind of fraudulent king over death. But Jesus wouldn't take the bait. You and I shouldn't be taking the bait right now. Don't take the bait. Jesus came to defeat death, destroy death, demolish death, not to prop it up and to reinforce it. You see, this is what happens when you begin to get familiar with false worship. There's such a thing as pretend, fake, false worship. First of all, you become self-deceived. Second, you justify form and tradition religion. You don't expect kingdom outcome. You're content with just religious form. Third, your worship begins to mock God. See, Satan asked God to worship him. God worship a worm? That's just, that's complete mockery of God. And then fourth, you quote scripture to justify sin. In verse six, the devil quoted Psalm 91. Can you believe that? The devil coming to Jesus, the word, and quoting Psalm 91 and says, well, Jesus, you know, the, the word says in Psalm 91 that he will give his angels charge over you to keep your ways. Let's just prove it. Let's just see if there's an outcome. And Jesus answered the devil by saying, it is written. My friend, when it comes to true worship, you have to be able to say, it is written. You know, I'm amazed, Pam, at folks that they want to pull some form of scripture out so that they can license their rebellion against God. Ah, Pastor Stephen, you know, the Bible says judge not so I can just do whatever I want to do. And you all got to like it, you know, whether you do or not. You can't go judging me. I can kind of I got my own little kind of, you know, Jesus government going on here. Well, God works in mysterious ways, says the book of Hesitations, chapter four. <laughs> it isn't in the Bible. It's not in the book. But nice try. I want to give you an A for, you know, trying to class it up a little bit there. Look, there's a science behind worship. I, I don't even want to go into the deep end of this because it can get so exciting. But I mean, this is almost like a whole nother chapter here. The neurophysiological effects of worship are scientific facts that can be accurately measured. Medical New Today said its effect on the brain is astonishing. astonishing. It can even increase your lifespan. Did you hear that scientifically, Pam? They've proven they can even increase your lifespan. Well, it says, I, I read in its medical studies that say that every part, every organ has a little tone, has a little movement, has a vibration, which is a tone. And every organ needs to move that. And if it gets locked, that's when disease can come. Yeah. You know, a favorite scripture of yours and mine is Proverbs 18, 21. Just read that for us. Yes. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they who indulge in it shall eat the fruit of it for death or for life. And so here's what scientists are finding out, that through worship, it actually um, activates um, the gamma waves in your brain, really? especially in your frontal lobe. And so it increases your horsepower, so to speak, when it comes to um, short-term and long-term memory. That's why, you know, even people with dementia and Alzheimer's a lot of times can access songs that they've memorized. So, you know, I'm telling you, worship works. It's powerful. It sends out spiritual waves, but it works through even the audio waves of your life. And like Pam read in Proverbs 18, 21, there's death and life in the power of your tongue. And I've proven it. I used to speak so much death in my life as a young man, and I was getting what I was saying. And then when I reversed it and started adhering to the word of God, Pam, and started speaking life, singing life, wow, everything changed. Well, I think it's, it's us glorifying the goodness of God, the truth of God, his character. And when we confess that, that applies to our life all the time. Worship sets your thermostat for life. Yeah, it's good. You know, it's like we all have a thermostat in our life and God is according to Proverbs 18, 21, given us the ability to set it for life or to set it for death. 
worship locks and loads. You notice if you walk into a house that's 90 degrees and you set it for 70, mm -hmm. it's still 90 degrees. You don't feel any change at all, but you know it's coming. Yeah. Right, you've set it at 70, you know it's coming. If you walk into a house that's freezing cold, you got your winter coat on and you set it for 70, you know, you may still need your coat on, but you know the warmth is coming. Worship sets your thermostat for life. So let me give you a true worship tune-up. And that's why I got my guitar on here. Pam, please remind us of what Jesus said in John 4. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. So we've learned that true worship must marry both the invisible and the truth. It's spirit and in truth. It's God is a spirit. He's invisible. You got to marry the tone, the tonality, the those unseen, unfelt factors. It's like I've said, you know, I could say to you, I love you. It's like I'm saying the right words, but the tonality, the spirit of it is ugly. It's disgusting. You know, it's an insult. And somebody could say, well, you know, in a court of law, well, Stephen said to Pam, I love you. But that's not really what I said. It's not God's tone. Right. It's and not the true right tone. worship marries the spirit and the truth. And so I just, I came up with this six string tune up just for you to help you to remember how true worship works. Okay. Number one, you got to have humility. You got to have humility. Pam, it's submission to God and man submitted, uh, submitted will. Remember Jesus in the garden said, Father, not my will, but yours be done. Not proud or arrogant, but humble, right? Yeah. So critical. You got to have that humility. Number two, you got to have an expectation. We already, we've quoted it a few times. Hebrews 11, 6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. You got to be believing that God's a rewarder of those who are waiting on him, seeking him, those who are going after him, those who are showing up, looking to God. You, you've said this and it's so true. The greatest gift we can give to God in his act of worship is to, is to trust him. Yeah. Our expectation, right? It's powerful. Number three, our attitude. Oh, this is a big one. Man, you know, you and I, we've been many years helping other people in worship ministry. And that's probably a big, between humility and attitude, that's a big challenge getting people involved with worship in church that have a good attitude. Yeah. And when they've got humility and a great attitude and they're expecting things, wow, something beautiful. There's those three strings already. <laughs> You can do a lot of things just with those three, right? But then we add V for virtuoso. And I'm not talking about... Um, I'm not talking about playing fast or... Although that is kind of fun, but you know. I'm not talking about virtuoso musical playing. I'm talking about from the he Proverbs 31, when the word talks about the Proverbs 31 woman, and it says she's virtuous. It actually is the Hebrew word for virtuoso. And it's really talking about that she's able, competent, powerful, valiant. It really has this beautiful um, unfolding to the meaning that's way beyond just virtuous. virtuous. Virtuous is beautiful, but it doesn't kind of give us the warrior side of it, which is able, capable, competent, powerful, and valiant. That's the virtuoso. God has called you to be a virtuoso in life and in your worship, as you worship God, to become good at it, even in difficult situations, to be driving down the road, somebody cuts you off. You know what a real virtuoso does? You know what? I bless that person. Lord, I don't know what they're going through. I don't know why they did what they did, but I bless that person. And I just thank you that you're taking care of them and keeping everybody on the highway safe. See, that's a virtuoso. Start singing a song. Right. I know, I know what it's like not to be a virtuoso and going, what are you doing? Yeah, right. right. That's a non-virtuoso. And then number five. So it's, it's important, right, is excellent. Moral courage and character, walking in love, not treating people like dirt. That's what excellent is all about. Do you have an excellence 
um, from Jesus on the inside of you. You know, like, I mean, it's one thing to come into church and say, I just love you, Lord. But if you're walking out and, you, and then you're arguing with your spouse and you're getting mad at that person and you're just like blowing off steam and getting angry and getting angry at your children and kicking the dog, that's not excellent. Or texting somebody that, you know, right? did you see that outfit she had on? And, you know. and then number six, noble, noble. That means royal blood. We kind of touched on it when we read out of the book of Revelation. But noble, that means royal blood, born again, child of God status, true identity, true identity. So when you put all six together, look at what you got, right? You've got like nice sound. So, but the problem is, think about it, Pam, if we just take one string. Let's just use this one, and we just detune it a little bit. And now listen. Ooh, ooh, that's nasty. And see, this is what happens in the spirit realm when people in heaven are listening to worship. When God's listening to worship, and you've got like that attitude that's way off. Somebody's got a bad attitude. It sounds it stinks. It really sounds stinky, doesn't it? It's kind of awful. So you gotta tune it up. You gotta get it back in tune. You gotta tune up that attitude so you can have that. You know, my dad would always say, your attitude affects the atmosphere, and that will allow or not allow the anointing from God to flow. So the three A's, attitude, atmosphere, and anointing. That's beautiful. So all six strings we got here are humility, your expectation, your attitude, as Pam was just talking about, virtuoso, talking about being our virtuous, able, capable, competent, powerful, valiant, then you're excellent. You got the excellence of Jesus on the inside of you. And then noble, meaning of royal blood. You know how you do that whole, the noble thing I think is probably the, the root of the whole cord. How do you get that noble thing taken care of? You gotta come to Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Jesus is the one that can make us a true worshiper and help us live in our true identity. There can be no true worship without true identity. That's what Jesus brought the woman to at the well in John 4. He brought her to her true identity. He didn't shame her, but he dealt with the reality of where she was at. And when he gave her true identity and made her a true worshiper, he turned her into a true Billy Graham, winning her whole city in one afternoon. How does that happen? She got the nobility of Christ on the inside of her. You might say, Pastor Stephen, how do I do that? It's easy. I just want you to pray this prayer with me right now. I'm just going to lead you. Just say this, Jesus, I choose to worship you. Say, I need to be saved. You're the only one who's died on a cross for me. Rose up from the grave. My hope is in you. Forgive me for all of my sins. Help me to know God's love. Fill me with your spirit. Come into my heart. Now I'm a child of God. I belong in the family of God. In your name, Jesus, amen.